I'm Rose Levy Berenbaum, and I'm making a very special ice cream called Pomegranate Pride from my newest book, Rose's Ice Cream Bliss. It also demonstrates and features a very special technique I call the art of concentration. I'm starting off, this is our mise en place, which means our advanced preparation to have everything ready with um, the pomegranate palm, which is my favorite one to use. And I should mention that although I love using things from scratch and natural ingredients, I find that there's some things that are really better when they're prepared. For example, the constantly actual pomegranate, partially concentrated juice. Uh, things like not perfect puree of Napa, their passion concentrate, or their blood orange. Those are things I think they're actually better to have prepared ahead by some commercially. But in this case, the pomegranate is gonna be concentrated fully so as to make a creamy, non-icy ice cream. Uh, this is the butter that's gonna go in and sugar salt, fine sea salt, part of the heavy cream, because the rest of the heavy cream goes in after making the custard base so that it cools it down and also doesn't get heated. And then the egg yolks, these happen to be duck egg yolks, which I really love because they're so bright orange and have an extra special texture, but of course chicken egg yolks work perfectly fine. This is freshly squeezed lemon juice and optional red food color, which I use with a dropper because it's really lethal as far as getting all over the place. And you don't want it to be too dark. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is to concentrate down the juice. And I'd like to do it in the microwave. Uh, I actually take out the weight. I also put it on the scale so that I can see how I reduce it to one quarter its volume or weight. You can do it also on a cooktop. But I found that in the microwave, you get the most pure flavor. I'll talk about that while it's bubbling away. I actually designed what I call a reduction spatula because, you know, even in savory cooking, where you, they say, or a recipe says, reduce by half, by quarter, but you don't know what that is without pouring it out or trying to eyeball it. This spatula has markings. For example, the amount here is just under two inches. So going down to just under a half inch would be a quarter. But I also have it on the scale so that I can see by weight, just in case I want to show you that both methods work perfectly well. I put a nonstick cooking spray, I like to use Pam because it doesn't have any odor, to coat. And here's the amazing thing that, you know when you do something in the microwave, either the, it can bubble out or it can burst and have a, a little explosion of air that goes all over the entire microwave. If you leave the silicone spatula in the microwave while you're bubbling it, it will not burst out. It's just like magic. And if you don't use something, you don't have to use silicone, you can use porcelain, but something that's microwave proof, then you, you, you just leave it in and the same effect. But if you don't use it, then you have to stir every 20 seconds or you lose not only do you lose half of your juice or more, but it coats the entire inside of the microwave. So this with a spatula, I just leave it in and start. And it doesn't take less time. Maybe it takes a little bit more time using a microwave. But I will tell you about how I came up with this as it's going. So microwave power, I'll set it for 15 seconds. I can always with 22. I can just check it from time to time because different microwaves have different power. This technique goes back almost a half a century for me because it was when I started making apple pie. And in those days, recipes would say, after you add the sugar and spices to the apples, let it sit and then throw away, discard the juices because that would keep the crust from getting soggy. But you know, I'm one of these people, and I'm sure you are too. If you love baking and you love cooking, you love the ingredients and you can't bear to throw any of it out. So one day I decided that instead of throwing away the juices, I would boil them down. And not only was it a really terrific texture for the bottom crust, but I didn't even have to use the usual amount of thickening. So it had a better consistency all around, plus it had a slightly caramelized flavor. So after that, I started concentrating everything I could get my hands on to intensify flavor, more flavor. But when it comes to ice cream, that really shines because ice cream is more well, as much about texture as about flavor, because when the texture is wrong in something, the flavor is affected too. And 
Liquid means ice particles forming, which is what we want to avoid in ice cream. I think it may be bubbling now. It takes a while to come to a boil, and then it starts bubbling furiously. And the reason that I use the, the nonstick spray is because if it does rise up, it will slide right down. You could just use a little bit of any shortening or butter or anything that will work. But if you, if you coat the whole thing, the whole container, that way when you want to take it out, you don't lose any of your concentrated juices. It's not bubbling yet, but you can see it's beginning to rise. So once it's concentrated down, I can add the butter right away because it will melt, the sugar, it will melt, the cream, and then I let it cool because you don't want to add the egg yolks until it's just barely warm. But you never have to temper the egg yolks, you just add them in and then make the custard. So that will be next. While the pomegranate is bubbling away, I want to tell you a cute story about concentration. It was 1990, I think, when I went to London to translate the Cake Bible into English English, and I was invited to visit the chef at the Connaught Hotel. And Michael Aldridge, who subsequently went to become the chef of the Channel, the train that goes through the English Channel, was a total delight. And I was shocked because in those days, no self-respecting chef would ever even consider having a microwave in his or her oven. So when I gave him the cake Bible, and he spent the entire night not sleeping, he told me, reading the whole thing, and we met for tea at Brown the next day, and we both sat in front of this elaborate tea, and neither of us had a sip of tea or a bite of the pastries. We were so fascinated with the discussion. He said, I have a microwave too in my kitchen, and I also concentrate juices. He said, I've discovered that it's a much purer flavor, and I knew I had found a kindred spirit. I haven't seen him since in all these years, but I often think of him, and I'm so encouraged to think that I wasn't alone in this concept. In fact, when I worked with Procter & Gamble as a consultant, the head of the Tropicana, uh, the engineer who was down in Miami, the head of the Tropicana plant, he said, yes, we do that. That's how we concentrate orange juice as well. So, they, of course, they have different machines, they don't use a small microwave, but it's really amazing how people build on each other's knowledge and how when there's no snobbery, all things are possible. Are you bubbling yet? Ah, yes, it's bubbling. All right, I'm going to take this out just so you can see. When it gets really hot, you're going to have to use pot holders, but see, it's nowhere near ready now. And you can see because when you put the, the spatula in, that it's well below the two inch but it still has to go all the way down to there. The pomegranate is now fully reduced and toward the end in the microwave, you should really check every couple of minutes because that's when it goes down really fast. If you're doing it on the cooktop, you can watch it. It's now exactly 143. It would start off at 573 grams and one quarter of that is 143. And if you see the spatula, that mark just below the half inch is the one quarter. And you can see how it does splash against the side, but it will all come off because I sprayed it with a nonstick shortening. So it's going to be hot. You may have to use a pot holder. Not the, these little handles are really helpful. And now we start adding the other ingredients. And I think I'll change to another spatula to make it go faster. But because it's still hot, everything is going to incorporate really easily. So this is the butter. I cut it in four pieces so it, it softens more quickly. I like to use these little spatulas, but I don't want it to splash. Okay. That gets stirred in until it's melted, and then the sugar gets stirred in until it's dissolved. I like to use the uh, organic butter because it, the culture butter because it has such good flavor. And I don't bother to use super fine, just fine granulated sugar because it's going to dissolve, especially when we make the custard. It's 
So this is actually 200 grams, that's one cup. And in the book, I say 260, but I now prefer to have it a little more tart and a little more firm because the more sugar you add, the softer it will be on freezing. Sugar inhibits the freezing a bit. I don't use glucose in this particular recipe. There's no need because I've made invert sugar virtually. Now this is a little bit of the fine sea salt, quarter of a teaspoon. And then only part of the cream, the smaller part, which I usually keep cold because that way it will cool off the rest of the mixture really fast since I don't want to have it cook the egg yolks at this point until we make the custard. And of course, always scrape out, maybe use this one for scraping, uh, always scrape out every last bit of the ingredients so it doesn't throw the balance off. The reason I call this pomegranate pride is because I never thought that it would be possible to make something out of palm, <laughs> pomegranate juice. I mean, I didn't like drinking it. I didn't like the taste, but when I tried it out, I'm in love with this ice cream. And the great thing is that it doesn't, it's not seasonal. I mean, you can have it anytime and it's always time for ice cream, in my opinion. So you can see that it's very dark because of the concentration, but by the time you add the yolks and you add more cream, it's going to lighten. And that's why I like to use just six drops of the food coloring. Let's see what the temperature is now. The, the, actually, the cream was not refrigerated at this point for the demo, so it probably is still too hot. Actually, no, it's 98 degrees. No problem at all adding the egg yolk, might as well. And by the way, when I do the egg yolk ahead, it isn't really necessary, but you know, I won't have my mise en place already. I also spray them with the pan nonstick coating because egg yolks will crust if they're just allowed to sit. Now at this point, you can either use a whisk or you can use the, the uh, spatula, which might as well use that. And just smush, smush it up against the side. <clears throat> and then the other ingredients go in later, which is the lemon juice, because I don't want to cook it too much, and the food coloring so we can adjust the actual color. See, when you stir the sides, it just comes right off. It doesn't stick to the side. And now this mixture will be cooked on a, I'm, I'll use an induction burner so you can see it when it's cooking, but it's just brought to between 170 and 180 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the ideal temperature for the egg yolk to not reverse its thickening afterwards. and. You know, you, of course it's going to be frozen, so it will be firm, but it will have a better texture as it's melting on the tongue when it's brought to the right temperature. And I always, with all my ice creams, let them sit overnight or at least eight hours in the refrigerator before spinning. And that will be our next step. This part of the ice cream process is made on a cooktop, making the custard. And I think this ice cream is so special, it really deserves a special ice cream cone. And I have instructions for both the vanilla and the chocolate cone in the book as well. So I'm using the thermometer. Uh, it's important to have an accurate one if you're using it at all, because you don't want it to curdle. But there's enough acidity in this ice cream that you can bring it over 180 and it wouldn't curl. I just don't want to risk it because there's no reason to. Right now it's 160 and I'm constantly watching it to make sure it's not exceeding the point. And after it reaches the right point of temperature, I'll then strain it through a press fine strainer which gets rid of the colliza from the egg yolk or any possible little bits that you may not want in your ice cream and I'm bringing up the temperature to go faster. And then the remaining ingredients to be added, which are the rest of the heavy cream. You'll see how much it lightens the color. And that I'm keeping refrigerated. I'll tell you why in a second. The lemon juice and the food coloring. And the thing is you don't want to put hot ice cream custard or hot anything in the refrigerator. It's not good for the refrigerator. It's not good for things that are in the refrigerator. And it's probably not even good for the custard. <laughs> so 
That's why I try to keep everything as cold as possible. But if you weren't able to do that for some reason, the thing to do is to make an ice water bath. And that's just a bowl of water with ice in it and submerged. In fact, I wouldn't even use glass because glass retains the heat. I would use metal to conduct the heat out of it as quickly as possible. Another little trick is to sprinkle the ice cubes, the ice with salt, which lowers the freezing temperature. Now, right now, we're just about 170, which would be fine, but I like it to be 180. So, this is almost ready to go. I can even risk turning it up a little bit. I love induction. I mean, it gives you so much control. I mean, I can even rest my hand on the top of the pot if it gets tired, because it doesn't heat where it should, it just heats where it should. This is my Greville induction burner. And, oh, 176, okay, I may get impatient and just take it off now. It's still going to be wonderful. But you can see it's beginning to steam, no problem. But the faster you stir, the slower it will heat up. So I definitely recommend paying attention to that. And I'm scraping the sides to make sure it's even. Although the induction heating is so even, it's... Really, I don't know what I did before the touch. Okay, it's now 178, so I would be happy with that. You can see I scraped it out of this, and it's hardly anything. The mirror was reduced, there's hardly anything left. And now it's going to be cooled in here. This is a non stick pan, which is another thing I really like because, whoops, because that way. You get every last bit, this wonderful juices and custard. I'm not worried about the staining the marble because the marble is polished, but I don't like getting little sprinkles of it on, and especially not if there's any food color because that may stain. Okay. And you can see that there are parts that are going to keep it from going right through and it'd be as silky as possible and that's why you'll see how much is left. If you overheat, if you overcooked it, you will see in the bottom much more of the residue. But this is perfect. So a fine strainer really is essential, I think, for the best ice cream. Another thing that I'm going to emphasize when I show you the next step is to pre-chill the ice cream maker because the faster the ice cream chills, the finer the ice crystals. They're going to be ice crystals, it's ice cream, but they should be so small, that such a small micron, that you, the tongue can't even perceive it as an ice crystal. See, this is all that's left. That gucky stuff. <laughs> Which might be good to eat, but not with the ice cream. And now I scrape off the bottom. And now we add, can add the rest of the cream and the rest of the ingredients and watch how it changes color. It is hard to wait eight hours, and then you have to wait until it matures in the freezer as well, but it's worth waiting for. Okay, Woody, can you please get the heavy cream? I'll just put this in here. And I'll start with the new spatula. Mm. Thank you. See how much more heavy cream is going to go in? I usually use part cream, part milk, but when we have all this liquid from the pomegranate, there's no need to. And this will cool it down. I love this when you're adding the cream to a berry mixture or a fruit mixture. The lemon juice gives it an extra lively flavor, but it's just a half tablespoon. And since I know how much I normally use, I'm not worried about waiting until the whole thing is stirred in. Okay, so 
So this is lemon juice. That will stain marble. If you have any marble, always keep it away from lemon juice. It is so acidic. It will just etch right into it and you can't polish it up. Okay. Now, you probably have never seen food, pro food color like this because I'm sure they don't make it like this anymore. It's about 50 years old. <laughs> it never goes bad. And you can see that I hardly ever use it, so that's why there's still so much left. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm covering it to make sure it doesn't topple over. I actually managed not to get it in my fingers, which is probably a first. See, it's, it's, not, it's going to be subtle, but it really gives it a better color. Especially when it freezes, it's going to lighten because it gets aerated. They call that overrun in the industry. How much increase in volume from how it starts as a custard to how it finishes as an ice cream. So next we'll be spinning the ice cream. And this makes a little bit more than a quart, depending on your ice cream maker, of course. That's it. Now comes the easy part because you've done all the work and now the machine is going to do the rest. I have two, re actually they both have their own refrigerants, two ice cream makers. One is the Cuisine Art, the other is the Breville. When I'm making the full quart, I like to use the Cuisine Art. If I'm using just a half quart, I prefer the Breville, but they're both great. At any rate, the most important thing, as I mentioned before, is to make sure that you've pre-chilled either ice cream machine. Or if you're using a canister model, to be sure to put that in the freezer at least 24 hours ahead to make sure it's cold enough to do the freezing. So I turn on the power and then the timer and start. And I let it run for 15 to 20 minutes. And when it reaches the right temperature, well, you don't actually see the temperature, but you know it's chilled down by 15 to 20 minutes. I stop it. This is been 15 minutes, 20 actually. And I first stir the mixture in case some has settled. And you can see how thick it's gotten just by standing overnight and chilling that thoroughly. That means it's going to be really smooth and creamy. And you can take the, the take out the co container, but I like to keep it in so that it stays as cold as possible. And just putting it in, scraping it all in. If you don't get quite every smidgen out, you can add it because there's a little door in the top of this machine that opens up while the machine is running. And see, I still have a little bit more to get in, but what I'll do is first I'll lock it in place. So here's, here's where that door is. And then just start. And as you can see, it's come almost up to the top of that batten or beater. And when it finishes, the volume will increase and it will be almost to the top of the machine. It may even touch the lid. So now we have to wait approximately for this amount. It will be 40 minutes. We'll just go and do something else until it's time to taste. You can hear that the machine has really slowed down and it's almost not straining, but you can see that it's ready to stop. And normally I would just wait until it stops completely, but it's so ready that and I'm ready. So I'm going to press the stop, and that means that it will continue to keep cold as we're emptying it up. Now you can see how it came up to the very top. This is kind of a bit full because it makes more than a, than a quart, this particular recipe. And I have my Don Vier canister, which I use not to churn the ice cream, but to keep it cold when I'm transferring it. I suggest using a bowl and put it in an ice water bath or surrounded by ice because you want at this point to keep everything frozen. And if you don't, if you're not able to do that, then um, the best thing is to just take the container out and stick the whole thing in the freezer. 
What I like to do is, well, I'll start, I have a little container in here as a plastic wrap so I can just pull it out. This is only going to take half the amount. So I'm going to start by taking out just what comes out really easily, and then I'm going to lift up the baton and scrape the ice cream into the container. The baton is the beater. Before, when I said that it comes up to the top, I meant it came up to the top of this run here. And when it finishes churning, you, you can see what they call overrun, how much volume has increased, and how airy. It's so tempting to eat it right this second, but we'll be able to taste it very soon. And of course, it's soft serve, you could eat it. But I like to have it mature in the freezer till it's a little more firm consistency. Uh, since this is going to make enough for two of my containers, what I'll do is, as soon as I fill this as easily as I can get it from here, from the container here, I'll then scrape it off the baton and get the next container out while covering it, keeping it cold. The secret to really good ice cream is not to let it freeze, I mean, not to let it thaw, it's because then when it refreezes, you have big ice crystals instead of the smooth, creamy ice cream that you worked so hard to get. So, this is perfect, and then I'll just cover it with plastic wrap, and, oh, too tempting. Okay, but actually this belongs over there, not here. So, we'll be putting this away in a moment, but in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick it in the freezer right now because I really don't want it to soften at all, and then I'll come back here to empty out the rest of it. <laughs> okay, can you open the, the freezer door? Thanks, for me. Um, well, here's the cover. Now it's safe. Okay, the next step is to scrape out all the ice cream on the baton into this container where it will keep it cold until I get the next container ready. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's so frozen in there, you can see, that it's even hard to lift out the baton. Now, most of these containers are non-stick, so you don't want to use metal. It makes it easier to get the ice cream out. But initially, you might have to use a more rigid plastic, like I usually have a cut-off old spatula so I can scrape down the sides. And then we get to lick the baton. <laughs> That's the part that kids usually like the most. It's like when I was a kid, I got to lick the beaters of the whipped cream that my grandmother made. And I asked her if I could just taste the vanilla by itself, and she said, oh no, it's, you wouldn't like it. And the minute her back was turned, I tasted it, and she was right. Vanilla is distilled in alcohol, and it is so bitter, unless you get the variety that's distilled in glycerin or glucose. But it's, you don't taste any bitterness once it gets mixed into other things. So this is about it. Um, I'll just show you how I scrape down the sides here. And all of these machines with their own refrigerant. You can either reset to do another batch or you can just reset if it goes off to, to keep it cold right in, keep it frozen right in the machine. Okay Woody, I think we deserve a little treat right this second to see how the ice cream came out. So, my hands a little bit messy, but You'll get the first one because you've been doing all the work here in the video. And thank you. Thank you. Okay, open wide. Oh. <laughs> Is that the best thing you can do? <laughs> I'm not hearing any ooms over there. A silence here is the ultimate compliment. <laughs> Okay, hope you all try the ice cream. I think you'll enjoy it.